Hello, we are Watching the Thrones. I'm Blake Graham. I am Eric Harsh. And we're here to talk about the second episode of the second season of The Game of Thrones. Yeah, in this episode we get to see um, Tyrion stepping into his role uh, as the Hand in a really official way, whereas we saw him with this confidence in the last episode, now we see him asserting that and uh, using this political power to his advantage to kind of uh, kick everyone else around and uh, establish himself as an authority figure. Last episode, he showed up with his swagger, as I believe you put it. Um, yep. But this time, he's not just talking to people, he's actually carrying out some actions, like his first acts as Hand of the King, uh, and a lot of it is removing obstacles and other political pressures that were around him before. It appears now that our our central characters are the hands of the king. Like, that's who we yeah. focus around. Uh, last season, we were focusing on Ned Stark. Uh, and he basically says that, you know, I'm not Ned Stark. I'm not going to take your threats. Uh, I know how to play this this game. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting that he's become the main character and that he's the one we're rooting for because um, he's easy to root for. He's likable. He's uh, kind of a... Uh, he's got this main character sort of uh, charisma, but at the same time, he's a Lannister, which is like, we're rooting for him to succeed, but him succeeding means would mean the dissolution of everything we thought was right in the first season. So it's interesting that like whole dichotomy between who you want to root for as a person and then as a bigger political force. Right, but even in that, he's kind of like a Lannister removed from the Lannister clan. I mean, we, we learn of his backstory where he's not the favorite son, he's not really the cherished guy, he's the dwarf, and for that he's like experienced ridicule throughout his life. Uh, and he's not so easy to completely go with everything that the Lannisters believe in. He's he's willing to put pressure to Joffrey. He's willing to put pressure. Well, I suppose he's not a Lannister in the way that everyone sees him. Uh, but he's willing to put pressure also to Cersei. Uh, he speaks his mind. Um, so he's within the clan and without the clan. And he also has his own set of moral principles, which he's willing to use unjust ways of reinforcing yeah he's willing to uh in order to achieve what he thinks is right he is willing to do things that are distinctly not right which makes him a more uh more powerful character in this sense than ned stark was because he's willing to uh be flexible with his uh with his his honor or whatever honor he has because he's certainly not as honor bound as ned stark is yeah, and that breaks, that's something I just love about Game of Thrones, is the fact that it breaks, like, our conceived notions of how things should work in cinema or television, uh, whereas we normally assume that, you know, the character that is honorable, the character that does the right thing, in the end will succeed. Last season, we learned that, no, in the cruel world of Westeros, the guy who does good, no matter what, well, that's the perceived right thing, he didn't end up all right. Because, uh, you know, his family split apart, the entire continent uh they're going to war he's dead uh his children are either betrothed to you know just crazy shithead kings um <laughs> underaged kings um or you know running away uh pretending to be boys so yeah it's uh, honor does not get you much in westeros yeah it's all about power learn. But and, and speaking of power, so we've got another character who we've seen kind of under the the helm of the Stark camp in Winterfell, Than Greyjoy. Uh, he's now going home to the Iron Islands to uh, recruit his family and his troops, but he's met with a not so great reception. Yeah, he's got the rude awakening of coming home and realizing he doesn't understand his own homeland and their customs, uh, although he thought seems like he thought he maintained some connection with his homeland throughout his whole time with the Starks. He comes back and realizes that they just don't respect him and don't really care about his, his birth or his bloodline because he's just n done nothing to establish himself to them other than sit in Winterfell. Right, and even as we see him for the first time in this episode, he's kind of become this different person because he has this assumption that he will receive praise when he returns home. He's when got he's the ego. Right, when he's on the ship, he's just, you know, he's just basically ravaging this random... Uh, Taking her to Pound Town. Yeah, this this ship's captain's daughter, I believe she was. She's just naked, and he's just 
having his way with he's her. Using her. He's... Yeah. In a very aggressive way that we didn't really see out of him before because he was always basically subservient to the Starks. But then, yeah, yeah he really disappears as a sexual beast because then when he gets to the islands, uh, he encounters this comely female stranger who offers him a ride. So he right away off the bat starts essentially molesting her because that's just, I guess, what we should uh, expect from him. I mean, even in the first season, the few... Uh, extended scenes we had in him there was sort of this darker edge and this kind of there was a lot of sexual stuff with him that was kind of a uh, more random in the first season and now it's kind of coming out into the open that he's got this this big ego and that he wants to like get with every woman and uh it definitely it certainly backfires in this case yeah because uh, it turns out that that nice lady isn't in fact his sister uh his sister, who his father believes should have more authority and power than he does, because, you know, she's led men in battle, she's she's been existent in the culture of the Iron Islands, she's actually a Greyjoy, whereas he, I, he, like, calls him, like, Ned Stark's, like, whore, and, like, says he's, like, dressing like a little girl and stuff like that, so completely just destroyed ego-wise, uh... And that's definitely going to backfire, because now he's going to try and prove himself and uh, do some strange yeah. things. We have to see uh, where he goes from here, because he went there on a mission from Rob Stark, who, I mean, we've seen his interactions with Rob, and they do treat each other as brothers. You know, they have with that bond that uh, they've been essentially raised together. But now he's confronted with just all of this... Uh, this new influence that's telling him not to be loyal to the Starks, that's telling him, if you're loyal to the Starks, then you are not worthy of your role here. So he really has to make a choice. Uh, when Theon shows up, uh, he's he's wearing all these nice clothes uh, that are, like, I guess, would be regular in Winterfell, which is known to not be a ritzy place. Like, they're in the north, they're, like... It's not like King's Landing where everything's all pomp and beauty. So he's wearing these kind of reserved clothes, and right away, you know, his father, Balon, asks him, you know, like, how did you pay for these? Did you pay the gold price, or do you pay the iron price? Yeah, he's saying um, even, even just any sort of armor or whatever he's wearing, he's just not worthy of, because the culture of the Iron Islands is such that uh, in order to earn anything, you have to kill for it. You have to, if you're going to be wearing some jewels, some... Uh, rings or whatever then you better have slain the man who owned those rings it's uh it's yeah. not not it's not about money it's not about uh birth or standing it's very much this a uh, bitter kind of dark culture that's all about a uh, all about battle right something that he's not used to and he's going to have to try and force himself into on the other side of everything we've got a little bit more stannis action so stannis is basically the most authentic I guess, claim to the throne if everyone accepts that Joffrey is not, in fact, the rightful heir, then Stannis is the eldest brother of Robert Baratheon and then should have the throne. But no one really likes him. He doesn't have an heir of his own. So a lot even, of problems with his yeah, time. Yeah, a lot of things going wrong. Uh, but we get a little bit more look into him uh, and what's, what's fueling him as he's kind of building his army, I guess. Yeah, and his uh, increasingly strange relationship with the Red Woman, which is a interesting, enigmatic character who's emerged, and uh, they really jump right into that in a way that's very different from the books. They're like having a strategical talk in like the war room where they've got all these like ships planned out, and she just takes her clothes off, and Stannis is like, "Whoa, I have a wife," and uh, she's like. She, you like have her locked in the tower, man. Like she ain't yeah. doing nothing. Like check check me out. I'm the Red Woman, Melisandre, or whatever. Definitely different from the books. It's definitely a, a huge step away from the books, really, because um, their relationship is certainly weird in the books, and certainly uh, something that's a cause for concern to Davos and the other characters. But it's never in really in that sense explicitly stated that they are like lovers or especially for that reason i mean that's a a significant departure so i guess we'll just have to see where that goes because that's where we closed out the storyline with them right was with yeah. them shagging which was an uh, and what a what a place for that to go down on the big table that's the whole map 
of uh, Westeros that's got like right. all the rocky sort of shapes for all the across the entire continent, and him just like having her on the table was just yeah. a, such a symbolic thing. That it's, yeah, it's basically like okay, you're going to screw your way to continent domination. Yeah, and, and it all starts there. Uh, we had a lot more with Arya this episode than we did last. It, it actually starts out with her um, pissing in a stream because she's a girl. She has to run away from uh, the entire group she's with. Um, and her, her relationship with Gendry then uh, kind of builds. Yeah, and they have her revealing her identity to him, which is kind of a shock. It's a little bit more sudden. I felt like uh, when I was reading the book, it was a more gradual thing, and she kept the uh, illusion up for a longer period of time. But now I'm, I, they really uh, sped forward with their whole... Uh, bond and their whole friendship yeah i actually thought that was really shocking too because just because gendry realizes that she's in fact a girl doesn't mean she has to like say who she is and like claim yeah. the title in front of him um yeah. which is it's, it's a big jump to see that happen very quickly yeah that's, and we get a little bit closer to figuring out who gendry is because uh he is um the king's bastard the dead king's bastard as they explored in the first season but he doesn't know that and pretty much no one else knows that but at least now they know they know someone is looking for him so there's kind of that going on as well where Arya reveals her secret and we know Gendry's got something going on so they kind of have that in common that they're both not exactly who they appear to be yeah they're more important than their circumstance implies yeah um and then finally uh we've got Jon Snow, north of the wall, hanging out with... Craster. You know, Craster, and his many wife daughters. Uh, and, you know, Sam actually start, ends up conversing with one of the wife daughters, and she... Yeah, bad, is, bad situation. Uh, yeah. You don't talk to the wife daughters. Because <laughs> yeah. you just don't. Cause Craster's it, was pretty, gonna, it was pretty explicitly stated not to talk to the wife daughters. So, yeah. I uh, blew it with that. <laughs> And it turns out wife daughter is preggers. So she's going to pop a baby out soon. Uh, and she's worried because in this situation when you have a boy, uh, Crasser doesn't like that. He doesn't take too fondly to that, which we learn later in the episode. They um, leave us at this point. That's very uh, such a cliffhanger with him kind of hearing these noises, going off into the woods, seeing what, trying to see what's going on, sneaking around. And it's... Uh, they don't show much, and it's all kind of fe going fast, and you, th you think it's something with the, the boys and with the babies. There's some sort of, like, sacrifice happening or something. And then uh, he gets knocked out all of a sudden. Yeah, something swings to the at him. And uh, that was surprising as well as a departure from the book, because uh, there's certainly elements of uh, the discontent with Craster's rules in the book, but nothing of this sort of uh, confrontational nature. And they never really went into exactly the circumstances of, of what happens to the boys. So um, that is, is an interesting departure because I'm not sure how it's going to affect other things as the series goes on. Other Because uh, Craster plays a role, a uh, small role, but still a, he's present later. And I'm not sure how that's going to affect that, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So what are you expecting tonight? Um, definitely a, more of the wall and more of uh, that cliffhanger and that resolution because uh, even with that important part at the end, I felt like there's been less of a focus on that storyline than uh, there really needs to be. So that's going to come up and um, I think also uh, Danny's storyline was uh, a little bit less uh, focused on. So we're going to see more of that and more with her situation. And, um, and then... Uh, Theon's choice is going to be a big part, I think. We're going to see where where he goes when he's uh, in this position where he's stripped of everything in the throne room and he needs to decide which which way he's going to go with his beliefs. And um, I think we're going to see how that plays out as well. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I would add, which is Runley. we gotta we got to find his I role mentioned, Yeah, everything. I mentioned that before. I'm, we haven't seen him at all. He's, yeah. he's a big person, so I'm hoping for that. Yeah, and I imagine there will be some Joffrey and Sansa, because there wasn't much of them in this past episode either. But Renly has really just been left out for a while. Uh, it's actually interesting that we got to seeing what's going on with the Greyjoys before we know really what's happening with Renly. Um, so I think it's time that 
in the pacing where that storyline should come up because we we've, we've talked about him the characters have talked about him uh, he's supposed to be the popular brother with all these forces uh and now we need to see see them deliver on that the next episode of game of thrones airs tonight on hbo at uh 9 8 central and uh we'll be back with more watching the thrones afterwards to tie everything together and keep you updated on our shrewd analyses of the matter